Trapping was widely used by local tribes after the first decade of the 19th century. By then, the steel trap had replaced traditional methods because of its ease of use and availability to the tribes through trade. While each individual had his own particular methods, the common way to trap was to find a good location along the water's edge and conceal the trap just under the water. About a foot further ashore, a stick which had been dipped in castorum, which is oil from a beaver's scent glands, would be pushed into the ground. Beavers are drawn to this scent, and as they emerged from the water to investigate, they would step into the trap and be caught. Animals even as large as bears could be trapped. Steel traps were especially effective if the fur bearer was secretive. These tools allowed for great flexibility and effectiveness among native trappers in Wisconsin. Spearing was a time-tested method of catching small fur bearers, such as muskrats, or even beaver in some cases, before the use of steel traps had come into prominence. European iron spearheads, which had one or two barbs on the shaft, made this method especially effective. A hunter would quietly approach a muskrat lodge during winter, walking on the ice. He would locate the frosty area on the lodge, which was the frozen condensation leading to the thin area of the hut through which the muskrats would breathe. Shoving his spear through this weak spot, he might catch a muskrat. He would then hack into the lodge and pull the animal out. Another method similar to muskrat spearing, but more common for harvesting beaver, was to dig into the beaver lodge. Sticks were shoved over the entrance to the den and the natives would often use dogs to locate the thinnest spot in the hut through which to dig. The beaver could not escape through their entrances and were thus dispatched in their lodges using ice chisels and hatchets. Europeans often wondered at the natives' abilities to stock and take wild game. These skills were applied to the fur trade with customary vigor. 18th century woodcuts illustrate natives waiting along waterways with rifles and bows. When a beaver made its appearance, it would be shot by the hunter. When traps are mentioned in early fur trade literature, they usually do not refer to steel traps, but to something called deadfalls. Deadfalls were designed to either ensnare or crush animals. Often, these trapping mechanisms entailed propping up heavy objects such as tree limbs and rocks and putting bait underneath them. When the bait was pulled by the animal, the object would fall on the animal and pin it. Pierre Esprit Radisson born in 1636, is considered by some scholars to be the first fur trader in Wisconsin. He was a nomadic trader explorer who inspired many a French fur trader after him. The Hudson Bay Company, which grew out of his work, followed this general tradition of a nomadic style of trading. Radisson's reports on his early successes during his excursions into the Old Northwest fueled French and English interest, as well as supplied European demand for furs. In his report on his third journey, he told of a great lake of castors, castor being the French word for beaver. He also spoke of how he could trade as many knives and goods as he could carry with him at a place called the Lake of the Stinking, which was his term for the Winnebago region of Green Bay. His vacillating work between the French and the British led to the establishment of the Hudson Bay Company under an English royal charter. Louis Joliet is most famous for his exploration of the Mississippi River Corridor with Father Marquette in 1673. But did you know that Joliet made many other expeditions through North America for the advancement of the fur trade? One such expedition occurred in 1679 when Joliet reported on the locations likely to produce good furs, even reporting on the trade in Wisconsin. Joliet's journey with Marquette was also was of great interest to the fur trade, especially considering that Marquette's order of Jesuits was itself making a fortune trading furs through their network of missions.
John Joseph Rollet was born in 1781. After starting his fur trade career in Canada, he moved to British Wisconsin, where he established himself as a fur trader in Prairie du Chien. After siding with the British during the War of 1812, he pursued relations with John Jacob Astor's American Fur Company. In this new role, he ruled the Prairie du Chien region's fur trade. John Harris Kinsey worked under Rollet prior to his work for the Bureau of Indian Affairs at Fort Winnebago. John Jacob Astor grew up in poverty in Waldorf, Germany. When he came to America in 1783, that all changed as he established a fur trading empire. He began climbing through the ranks in the American fur trade, starting in New York and expanding by shipping furs to China. In 1808, Astor expanded this enterprise by attempting to establish an experimental major post on the Pacific coast. This failed, but after the War of 1812, when the British lost their right to trade in the United States, Astor began edging into the fur trade in the Midwest. Shrewd decisions, strategic mergers, and purchases of rival companies led to a trading network empire, which pushed west to exploit fresh sources of furs until its gradual demise before the middle of the 19th century. Pierre Paquette was a major figure in early Portage history, but did you know that he was first and foremost an employee of the American Fur Company? During the days prior to Fort Winnebago's establishment, the Ho-Chunk often charged the American Fur Company a toll to carry their goods from the Fox River to the Wisconsin River. This trade route, being one of the most lucrative and the only one Joseph Rollette used at the time, required securing. Thus, Rollet employed Pierre Paquette to establish an American Fur Company post on the portage. Paquette would haul Rollet's goods across the portage, thus bypassing the natives' toll charge. Paquette also traded directly with the Ho-Chunk in the region. Due to his inability to read or write, he was said to have kept all his credit and debit records in his head until he hired a clerk three years before his death. Birch bark canoes were the backbone of transportation during the fur trade. While they could be built any size, fur traders used canoes much larger than the traditional Native American canoe, usually reaching lengths from 25 to 35 feet, enabling them to haul thousands of pounds of cargo. These canoes could easily be portaged, which means carried on the backs of the traders across land. Portaging was necessary to allow traders to reach remote waterways in search of new venues for their trade goods and better supplies of furs. These versatile canoes, while requiring frequent repairs such as recaulking the seams, were the standby in any fur company's shipping fleet. The necessity of water travel dictated how fur trade freight was packed. A general rule of thumb in the fur trade is that if an area had a viable population of beaver, there were no roads through that region. Aquatic transportation was thus required. Furs were packed in bales weighing up to 90 pounds each. While they could have been made larger, the need to portage these furs and load and unload them frequently from the boats limited their size and weight. Additionally, trade goods were generally hauled in barrels. Barrels were easier to transport by boat due to their ability to be rolled across the land when portaging and their propensity to float if the boat were to capsize. Keel boats were essential to the fur trade as it expanded west around the second decade of the 19th century. The Missouri River trade prompted the application of flat-bottomed, high cargo capacity boats due to the long distances between posts along this waterway. These 50 to 80 foot boats could operate in relatively shallow water, driven along by a crew using poles to provide thrust. In the Missouri River District, the keel boats would travel upstream to the remote posts and then take a run back down the river to deliver the furs to St. Louis. Once the furs had reached a central processing location along a major waterway, they would be transferred to large steam-driven boats. This was an example of the fur trade adapting to new technology. 
less than two decades after Fulton's nearly unsuccessful introduction of the steamboat to America, the American Fur Company had put these marvels to work, ferrying furs from St. Louis to the Gulf of Mexico. They could carry heavy loads both upstream and down using mechanical muscle rather than costly human rowers. John Jacob Astor first bought a fleet of ships to support his fur trade with China in 1795, although ships dedicated specifically to the fur trade had already been used by other companies for years. These ships were able to withstand rough seas for an extended period of time, whether they were headed to China or to Europe. Ships being built during this year were often more than 110 feet long and could haul almost 500 tons of cargo. Many of these ships were armed with cannon to avert piracy on the seas, as well as demand respect from the natives if the ships traveled any distance into the interior. Such a fleet was a necessity since the main market for furs was not in America, but across the ocean in Europe and Asia.